was in my 29th year, I woke up in the middle of the night and this was not uncommon for me, waking up in the middle of the night and feeling intensely uh, depressed and in a state of great fear at the same time. And uh, that happened again that night and the thought occurred to me, I can't live with myself any longer. And that thought repeated itself in my mind. I just, I can't live with myself. And then suddenly, I looked at the thought. I kind of stood back from that thought and looked at it and said, that's a strange thought. I cannot live with myself. Am I one or am I two? This, this thought seems to show that there's two, two people here. I and the self that I cannot live with. I didn't have an answer to that question, it's just that question, that puzzle arose in my mind. Much later, it reminded me, to, it reminded me of a koans that they have in Zen that are puzzles that are designed to stop the mind. For example, what is the sound of one hand clapping is a famous koan. And it doesn't have an answer on an intellectual level. And so the question that arose in my mind also didn't have an answer on an intellectual level. Who am I and who is myself that I cannot live with. But that question triggered an inner shift, something inside me that I didn't understand it at that point, must have disidentified from the self, the unhappy me as I later called it. So a kind of an inner disidentification happened. The I am, which I later recognized as the consciousness, that I am, separated itself from the conditioned entity, the conditioned consciousness uh, that was, that provided me with my sense of identity, the self. And that consisted largely of an unhappy story. <laughs> so then I felt I was like being drawn into some kind of vortex of energy as if I were disappearing in that and there was still a moment of resistance and I heard something almost like a voice inside me that said resist nothing so I gave up resisting the feeling of almost the feeling of disappearing into nothingness and so that don't remember very much else of that night all I know is that the next morning I woke up and I opened my eyes and I looked around the room and everything seemed as if I was seeing it for the first time. Fresh, new, alive. The light coming through the windows, familiar objects on the table. They looked fresh, new and alive. So I got up and went out for a walk and I looked around and everything seemed so peaceful, even the traffic in the city seemed so peaceful and I knew something strange had happened. There was suddenly, everything was filled with aliveness and peace and I didn't know why. And so, and that went on. And then this inner peace as the background to all experiences and the background to all sense perceptions even as the background to my thinking, that then never really left me again. But it took me a long time to understand it, to be able to put it into words. And so a little later I started investigating other spiritual teachings for the first time, Buddhism, Christianity and more contemporary spiritual teachings. And very quickly I recognized the truth that is in many cases hiding underneath sometimes centuries of cultural uh, additions, interpretations and misinterpretations. And I could see the truth that's in Buddhism, that's in Christianity, the original teachings. And in turn, they shed light on what had happened to me. I, for example, I picked up the New Testament and I read Jesus' words, the peace that passes all understanding. 
I said, that's exactly what I feel. I have this peace and I don't understand what it is. <laughs> so me, he must have had the same experience. He, peace suddenly arose, which was not causally related to anything in the external world. It wasn't caused by something wonderful happening in, the, in my external environment. Uh, so it didn't seem to have a cause, an external cause. And then later I visited Zen teachers and so on. And again, I recognized the truth of Zen immediately. But they also helped me to understand and, and put it, what had happened to me into a wider context. For example, I remember talking to one uh, Buddhist monk who said, um, who talked about uh, coming to the end of always having to think, thinking. And he said, Zen is about not thinking ultimately. And I immediately realized something that I actually, strangely, I hadn't realized before, that my thought processes, ever since that happened that night, had become reduced by maybe 80%. So I wasn't actually thinking that much anymore. And that's why there was so much peace. So I realized the continuous mental noise, as I now call it, which is the compulsive and largely useless thinking that most people are continuously engaged in, that had come to an end. There would still be some thought, and thought could, I could use thinking when I needed it, and occasionally thoughts would come in and out, but there were huge stretches of no thought. And in those long gaps and intervals of no thought, there was that wonderful experience of inner peace. And I realized that inner peace had been there before, even when I was still anxious but had simply been covered up by the anxiety, by the hyperactive mind. And so this then gradually developed into a spiritual teaching. So I'm, the spiritual teaching now uh, attempts to show people that they have within themselves already what they may perhaps are looking for on the outside the aliveness, the peace, the sense of deep inner fulfillment is already present in every human being as their innermost essence. So it's not a question of needing to obtain or acquire something new, which is often what spiritual seekers are looking for. Everybody is looking for to acquire something to fulfill him or herself. They may be looking for it on an material level, or on the level of experiences, or on the level of accumulating knowledge, or accumulating wealth, or spiritual seekers want to uh, add more spiritual experiences to who they are, or find themselves at some point in the future, and you can't, because if you're looking to the future to find yourself, you're missing yourself already the essence of your being, which you can only find in the now. So my realization that night took me years to understand, and in the process of understanding it, at the same time, people would already come to me occasionally and ask questions. So gradually, I was able to talk about it, and I was able to recognize in others what I had been through. They, it's the same dilemma, perhaps with the exception perhaps, that I was suffering from it more acutely than many others. That's all. I was even more deeply immersed in the mental noise and the emotional turmoil than would be normal. But the same mechanism operates in everyone. So the teaching now is to point out that there is a dimension in you that is deeper than what you normally identify with as yourself. That is deeper than the, the me, the personal history that most people believe is who they are. And so the recognition of that dimension comes when you make room inside yourself for the present moment. Because it can only come out of an inner alignment 
with now, as I call it, which is life itself. The stream of thinking is always concerned with past and future. So for most people who are identified with thinking all the time, every thought is invested with a sense of self and me. So every thought grips you completely and you are in it. This is what identified means. Every thought that arises becomes a me. and You think it and you're in it. And so most people are dragged along all day long by this mind stream. One thought after another. And within that mind stream there is a mind made sense of self, a me, consisting of past memories and experiences and things that my mind has identified with and that contribute to my identity. They are all thought forms. For example, my possessions, my knowledge, my experiences or what people have done to me, or what I have done to people. Things that whatever you identify with and then hang on to in your mind becomes a me. And that was really the self that that night I recognized as not really me. So there's the mind stream, there's identification with the mind stream, and there's the possibility of stepping out of the mind stream by accessing the present moment. Now to most people the present moment is almost doesn't exist because what they're really interested in is the next moment or the one after that. So they live always towards the future. They live towards the next moment. And unconsciously they regard the next moment the next point in the future that they need to get to, unconsciously they regard that as more important than this moment. Not realizing that the future moment that they so desperately want to get to, tonight, tomorrow, whatever, or in any activity, needing, wanting to get it out of the way as quickly as possible, needing to get to the, the end point, on a small scale, on a large scale. Yes. <laughs> For example. Yes. <laughs> yes. And so they don't recognize that the future has no existence except as a thought form. So when you always live towards the future, you, you, uh, you live your life trapped in the conceptual reality of thought forms which assumes a greater significance for you than the, than the immediate reality of life, which is always now. Because your life consists entirely of the present moment. And to most people, that's, if, you re, if, you, if you truly realize the significance of that statement, your entire life consists of the present moment. Your life is never not this moment. Even when you remember the past, you can only remember it now. And when you think about the future, you can only think about it now. But people live as if the present moment were an obstacle that they need to overcome in order to get to some better point, which never arrives. So that's a mad way to live <laughs> and it makes living hard. It makes living into an effort. Amen. This is the, we have been conditioned over thousands of years, the human mind, which was a wonderful thing, the ability to think at some point, long, long time ago, must have arisen in humans, the ability to conceptualize mentally. And this is opened up a whole new dimension for humanity and of course it has made humanity the most powerful species on the planet because through the humans are not not physically the strongest species but they were able to dominate all the other species because of their ability to think and so that developed slowly, probably 
in the mythological form, it's, it's expressed in the story of uh, Genesis at the beginning of the Bible when uh, they eat this apple that comes from the tree of the knowledge of good and bad to differentiate this that that comes only through the ability to think to analyze to separate and so that gradually developed in humans and at first it wasn't a problem it opened up new possibilities then over thousands and thousands of years the thinking mind became stronger, it grew and grew and gradually they lost connectedness with something that is deeper and more essential within themselves. We could call that being, the sense of aliveness, a deeper intelligence even that is more than just the thoughts that go on in your head. So gradually humans, because of the growth of the thinking mind lost their ability to sense their deeper connectedness with life. And then, now we have arrived at a point where our whole sense of who we are is caught up in the mind and in thought. So, we have been through an evolutionary stage which was a necessary one for humanity and we could call that the stage of mind, the stage of thought, and to such a point now that we are completely possessed, I use that word, we are possessed by the mind without knowing it. We cannot stop thinking, it seems. We can, but for most people that's not yet a reality. They have to think, the compulsion to think, and to derive your sense of self from the movement of thought. This is, we're arriving at the end of this whole evolutionary stage and for humanity now to go on it needs to transcend the mind, no longer be possessed by the mind, to go beyond the compulsion to think into a deeper level of being. So it's almost like regaining what they have lost. But if you, when you regain something that you lost, you regain it with a deeper awareness. And this is the process that we are involved in now, that humanity is involved in now, because an evolutionary transformation, a transformation of consciousness, really is no longer a luxury, so to speak, is no longer optional for humanity. For the first time in the history of humanity, a transformation of consciousness is a necessity if humanity is to survive, because we are creating havoc on the planet. We are creating hell to a large extent on a planet that potentially is paradise.